Hello. Hi, James. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I am great. I was wanting to tell you that I have had such a better week. You know how uh, we switched my schedule just a little bit. This week has been so much better. And so... <laughs> we piggyback off that. I have noticed in um, a lot of the comments, people are saying, you look great, Dr. Lee. What, <laughs> you know, just you, you look amazing. And um, someone said, you know, you look so much younger. So it, it really is apparent that. You I know. Are, isn't it? Isn't it crazy? <laughs> and the reason I'm the reason I'm saying that is because, hey, Super Sunny D, what's happening uh, there's hardly anybody with us. We didn't tell anybody we were coming on basically because we've been trying to get the 30 day challenge going. Right, Jamie. Yes, so I assume yes. some people will. Hey, Santana in the house. How's everything going? I'm sure people will be trickling in here, but uh, we're glad to see you. See you all here today. I know. Well, that's why I wanted to share that because I you know, tell people to make a plan. And what we're going to talk about in the offense is to create a flexibly scheduled life that works for you. And, you know, I always talk about when I, uh, no, this isn't an, it's, this is the same time, Super Sunny D. We're always here at high noon on Fridays. I'm sorry to cut us off. Hey, David. Uh, let's see who else is here. Tuana, I'm great. How are you? Doing great. Uh, Cheyenne. Saeed, Rob from Indiana. Um, hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, you know, I was just saying that I had let my flexibly scheduled life break down for about how long do you think? A month and a half, maybe, <laughs> which is it much too good, long. Good two month, months, yes. two months, two months, probably. And uh, we made just some slight changes to my schedule. And I realized this week, you know, and this is what this journey is about. And obviously my journey is different, you know, right now where I'm at in life, but you know, my kids are teenagers and I love momming. Like I love working, but I totally love momming. And when I work all the time, there's nothing left in me, nor is there any time to do the momming that I need to. So, oh, David, sorry to keep talking and some time zones change, Jamie. Our time zone changes this week. This, week. Oh, this weekend. So that is a very good call, but probably can't be avoided, right? If some time zones change and others didn't. Yeah, good call, David. So we'll probably have lower people than normal, but it's recorded. So hopefully if people really want to. Hi, Sparkle. What's going on? Um, so getting my flexibly scheduled life back and yeah, it's definitely paying off. I getting more sleep. I took my kids to the mall a couple of times just to get them a couple of new, uh, you know, things to wear, which is important. Spent time just hanging out with them, all good stuff, you know, so, uh, don't get me wrong. I haven't worked out at all this week, but next week too. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Rob. Oh, Rob single Rob. I'm glad you bring it up because that's one thing that we're going to talk about. Somebody had the question and I asked Jamie to include it, but I'm just going to throw it out there right now that someone had the question. Okay. After this 30 day challenge, I'm single. What do I do then? And I think that's a really important question. So we're going to answer that before we get off. Um, hi, SJ. What's happening? Koala Chris. Uh, you're welcome. I am trying to make the world a better place one brain at a time. Hi, Ivan. Hey, ABC. What's happening? Okay, Jamie, do you have, I know you usually have it organized so that we can think about some questions. We're going to keep, um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. But we want to try to keep questions focused on the videos that came out this week for the 30 day challenge. So on making a plan, setting up your defenses, if you decide if you're going to have sex while you're doing this 30 day challenge or if you are not um, being able to think about relapses and how you can learn from them, knowing that they are not inevitable. Some people convince themselves they're inevitable and that's the hijacker talking. So I want you to know you can avoid them and it might be difficult, but if, it, if you succumb to a slip or a relapse, you definitely can learn from it. So those are kind of the topics. Do you have a starting point? I do. It was, it was kind of, um, one of them is, you know, if you don't have a partner, what do you do after the 30 days? But also, can you talk about avoiding porn for people who are single? I've been in a relationship and a potential relationship where my 
uh, secretive viewing of erotic content negatively affected the relationship. But for years now, I've resorted to viewing porn as as a coping mechanism because Mm -hmm. I don't think that I could get into a relationship. Yeah, well, a framework shift is the first thing that's necessary, but it's difficult to shift your framework from, you know, I can't get in a relationship, so I'm just using porn to I can get in a relationship. And, you know, the whole program that I offer and everything that I talk about is changing your mental concepts by taking new action steps. So if you don't, you know, have a relationship and you're going to porn because of that, there's two action steps you should, you can take, and you likely should take number one, stop viewing porn because it makes it difficult. And we already said it, you already said it in the question. It makes it difficult to achieve and sustain a healthy relationship if you're acting out in an unhealthy way. So like the two things just don't go together, having an unhealthy habit, habit that damages your brain and keeps you going back for more doesn't go along with getting a new partner in a healthy relationship. So you have to give that one, you know, you have to leave that behind. And at the same time, this is the advice that at the end of this 30 days, what do you do if you're single? Start doing it now. You can reach out to people in a circle that feels good to you. Find like-minded people. Don't be completely focused on finding a partner. You know how that goes when you're looking for something and you desperately need it. I always say this about money. I tell Jamie, like, I, you know, I need money. We all need money to stay alive. I have six beautiful children, five teenagers. I need to be able to feed everybody. But the minute I worry about making money, I don't make money. So Jamie and I keep ourselves focused uh, and we keep each other focused on helping people because when we help people, we make enough money to live. And so the minute I'm like, we need to make money, it's like literally I'm repelling it because I desperately want that thing. So we stay out of that space. So when it comes to you wanting a partner, and of course, okay, it's okay to move forward in, in, in being hopeful. But, you know, if you're into chess and you join the chess club just to pick up women, that's not going to work. You're going to repel because you're moving into that that chess club with the wrong intention. Now, if the intention is to meet people so that you can actually brew and develop healthy relationships that are more than just sexual, meeting whole people and finding one person in in that group that you vibe with and that you jive with, that's how you develop real relationships. And so you could be doing that right now during this 30-day challenge. One person that I work with, I love it, in the meeting on Monday, he said that he's doing great leaving porn behind, He's doing pretty good with leaving masturbation behind, but that he really wants that healthy relationship. And if he could get the healthy relationship, it would help him leave masturbation behind forever. And, but he hasn't taken any steps towards that. So he's using the 30 day challenge to join things and to go to places where there are like-minded people to develop intimate relationships and then take the slow boat. If you see someone that you like, spend time with them then ask them to get coffee or a drink, then ask them to get lunch. So when you're moving through your life purposefully, because in that regard, you're getting dopamine from the hobby, you're getting dopamine from connection with other people, and then you know you're doing something towards finding a partner that can make it so that you're pragmatically optimistic. And I love the thing you say, you know, your electrical energy can make it so you either repel things in, or attract things in life you desire or repel them. And that is so true because anytime, um, you know, most friends that I have, when they're looking at it, it never happens. And as soon as they stop, it it, it happens. Oh, totally. Yeah, I know. We have, we have friends that tried to have a baby forever and they can never have a baby. And then as soon as they stop, they have three kids. <laughs> you know, that was a while ago, but it's, it is like, you know, your energy repels it. Um, Jamie, if it's okay, and you can stop me if you want, I was going to answer Ivan Xavier's question about, Good. because we've gotten a few of these emails this week. I'm sure you've seen it. And, and self-awareness can be low about this stuff at the beginning. So Ivan's question is, is it better to go get a happy ending massage without watching porn. And so a couple of people have emailed us, is it better to have sex with a prostitute or just go have hookup sex with people instead of watching porn? And actually I had to sit with this and think about this. 
because theoretically, but this is not the answer, just so you know, theoretically, if you were having sex with a human being, it's much better for your brain. But if you're hiring somebody or you're using somebody in a professional capacity, if you're using that person, you're just objectifying that person. And likely you're acting out fantasy from porn. It's not at all the same as developing a healthy relationship with a healthy partner. So the answer is no. Why swap out one bad habit for another bad habit? One that now is being harmful to another human being. Prostitutes don't want to be prostitutes. I know nobody thinks that's true. They're hurting souls who have moved in that direction because of their wounds. Same thing for people who are giving happy ending massages. You don't want to take advantage of wounded people for your own pleasure and benefit. And when you see it that way, and the same thing for porn, the reality is for porn, what I care most about is your brain and that that's not good for your brain. What's better for your brain is letting that whole pattern unwire of going to sex to regulate your mood and go to something else to regulate your mood while you develop healthy sexuality. Yes, a much bigger job, but not impossible. And you can totally do it. Um, I had a, a question from Tim. Um, he says, you know, what if, if someone wants to remain single, what did he do? Yeah. So uh, that is a great question too. <clears throat> so I just talked about this on the podcast that I recorded yesterday with Dr. Rena Malik, who is a urologist, and we were talking about healthy masturbation. And there is a lesson in my 90-day program on healthy masturbation and that you can achieve it. Now, can you personally achieve it? I'm not sure. And I'm going to tell you how you can know. The answer is likely no, definitely not right now, but maybe in the future. But what healthy masturbation is, is staying out of fantasy and staying with the feelings in your body so that you can have, you know, a sexual release that isn't taking you back to euphoric recall of pornography. Many people I work with, they'll go to euphoric recall of people that they've been with in the past who are acting out some of the porn genres. Like if your brain's going to unhealthy fantasy, which you may or may not even know what that is right now. Like you might not, you might think some of the things you're thinking are healthy and we can parse that out in a minute. But, you know, if your brain's going there, then, you know, that's not what we want you to do. So in the end, if you can build a healthy masturbation habit of not masturbating very frequently, and actually I've read a bunch of studies, the, what was considered not frequent was less than one time a month because wow. if you're going to, yeah, which is, and actually it was studies I read on prostate cancer, which I know everybody uses the excuse. I masturbate so I don't get prostate cancer. The studies show that if you masturbate more when you're young, 20s and 30s, two to seven times a week, you're at a higher risk for prostate cancer than you are if you don't, but the opposite for having actual sex. If you, so it's ejaculation's different if you are masturbating versus if you're having sex, you have sex, it's a healthy amount of time with a healthy amount of stimulation. That's healthy. If you're masturbating more than one time a month, you're depending upon it for mood regulation and you are putting your brain and your prostate at risk. Yeah, really cool study. Dimitri Apollo is the author of that one study. I read a whole bunch of studies. The other studies that show that masturbation is healthy for, to avoid prostate cancer is in people over 55. Some of the studies are looking at 60. And if you go to cancer.org right now and you look up prostate cancer, cancer.org says Prostate cancer in young men is rare. It uses, uses the word rare there. And it's moderated by age and how much masturbation. So we'll, we can cross that bridge on a different day because I have some videos coming out on that. But, um, you know, a healthy masturbation habit. Many people are, not many people, the people who choose to stay single in a healthy way are usually those who are in a religious order or culturally they're staying single for any amount of time. So that's very difficult to do. Just so you know, we are sexual beings. So, you know, if your goal for being single long-term has something to do with sexuality, it's likely uh, unhealthy sexuality. That's fascinating. Really uh, and I can't wait to listen to the podcast with, with you and uh, Rena. Yeah, Just, it's great. Uh, it's great. It's going to be great. So I've got a question from uh, Frojo. 
He says, you said once no flap changes your brain frequency and that you become more attractive. Can you further explain that? Sure. So when you are caught up in a porn and masturbation habit, especially if it's porn and fan or fantasy. So if it's masturbation to unhealthy fantasy, what happens is we know this from science. It puts your brain in the extreme of using electrical energy. It has your brain. It makes your brain use more extra fast speed that creates anxiety and hyper stimulation and hyper arousal. That's the brain that needs the edge taken off. So it's creating the need to use more porn. People don't realize that. It's the cause, not the effect. So when you watch porn, it gives you more anxiety, which brings you back for more. Very temporarily, it takes the edge off, but then it swings in the opposite direction. It makes you feel worse. Then over on the other side is the extra slow brain speed. And so then what that does is it makes you feel groggy. It makes you feel unmotivated. It makes you feel general malaise. It, it, you know, it makes you feel like you want to stimulate your brain. So when your brain feels like it needs to be calmed down and stimulated, you keep going back to porn. When you leave porn behind and you're on a no fap journey and you're getting healthier every day, what happens to your brain is it comes out of those extremes into the middle where you use the, the speed for calm focus, which now you can get on purpose in your work, in your relationships, in your hobbies, because your brain feels good. It feels calm, but you're able to focus on the things that you care about. Your brain's not being pulled back into the screen. And that's how it works. That's why it's so important because all the good stuff in life comes out of a brain being in the middle. When your brain's out in the extremes, you snap at people. You're angry. You're irritable. You, you're at a party and you don't want to be there because your brain just wants dopamine from porn. What you train it to do is when it goes into the world, there's no porn, there's only cortisol. I've talked to a few people this week that, that told me that what I said in some of the videos really resonated with them because they used to love their work. And for seemingly no reason, they feel like they're burnt out. And the reason is your brain is being fried. And so when it's being fried, you're dropping out the activity in the frontal lobe and you're desensitizing the reward center, which means work, work doesn't give you the reward that your brain wants anymore. Only long hours of porn and masturbation do. You've trained it just to go into the screen for all that stimulation. Life isn't doing it for you anymore. When you leave that behind, life does it for you. Work does it for you. Your partner does it for you. Your family, your friends, your hobbies. Naz says, uh, I'm on a very long streak and I'm having vivid dreams about finding a partner. Is this a sign of recovery? Uh, well, if you're having really vivid dreams, uh, honestly, you know what I do with my kids? This has nothing to do with neuroscience and we do it in our family. You can look up the meanings of dreams, which I don't know how much science there is behind it. And usually it's the opposite. Like, you know, I looked up something recently for my daughter and it's just for fun. But what I am here to tell you is that if you are having vivid dreams, it means your brain's not sleeping all the way. It means you're like half asleep because when you are full blown asleep, there's no dreaming when you're and, and your brain does cycle between deep, deep sleep and less deep of sleep about four times a night. So if you find like you're having a lot of dreams and you're not and you're remembering them, it's more like lucid. So. So what it can mean is that your brain is changing and it is recovering because your sleep cycle is now different. Your sleep cycle should change. Most people report that sleep's more difficult at the beginning, but then sleep will get better eventually. So it's likely um, a sign that your brain, the way that it's being used and using the electrical energy that I just described is changing and rewiring itself and then, you know, I like to be pragmatically optimistic about finding a partner. That is, you know, if it's in your subconscious, your dreaming is your subconscious. So it's, you know, I like to look at our subconscious and go, okay, what's going on in there in those dreams? Because that's something that usually needs to be tended to or something that you care about in your real life. And so then being hopeful about moving in that direction because of recovery is totally awesome. There's a huge body of literature on learned helplessness. People think it's never going to change for them. And guess what happens when you develop learned helplessness? It doesn't change for you. You get stuck in the rut. Hopefulness is the opposite. You think it's going to change. And it's the placebo effect on top of using strategies. And the pragmatic part is 
get out there and do the things I just said about engaging with people so that you can actually meet a partner. You can't sit at home watching a screen and meet a partner and you can't go on dating sites usually and meet a healthy partner. The healthy people are in the world. And so you have to go into the world. And I know it's tricky because of COVID, but when you go into the world, you can find them. And I've always, well, and not just heard, but experienced that, you know, finding somebody through somebody else is, is, is usually the best way to find a partner. Um, so that's, you know, finding yeah. more friends, you get to know more people, they can introduce you. Um, yeah. So just a thought. Yeah, totally. And that's, that's why I say get into like-minded groups because you make more friends than before you know it, there's, you know, a bunch of people that you have common interests with. So mm -hmm. here's a comment, um, ma'am, this is Harshit from in India. I want to know something about this issue. Is spiritual approach as better as a scientifically as scientifically mm -hmm. as I found various videos across YouTube? Please highlight this one. Sure. Sounds great. So uh, I have a secret for you. My approach is, <laughs> in fact, it has a spiritual basis to it, because when you go through a transformational journey, it's spiritual in nature. It's not religious in nature necessarily, but spiritual for sure. And the reason that I'm sharing that with you, and it's a secret for the 112 people who are here right now, is that it is important that you tap into purpose. And where does purpose come from? You know, purpose is something that is innate within you. You didn't put it in there yourself. It was put in there very in a spiritual way. It's something that's unique to you. So let, let me actually answer the question, though, is that if you're in a program that's just spiritual, what it will do for you is shift your brain for a, an amount of time. It'll shift you out of those extremes into the middle. That's what prayer is proven scientifically through neuroscience to do. That's why if you have the inclination to pray and include it in your program, do it because prayer can shift your mind. And physically, if you get on your knees or you change the way that you're using your body orientation, prayer can shift your mind and your physical space. And if you hear me say, I, I said it this week in the 30 day challenge, first thing to do, make a plan and change your physical and your mental space. And there's lots of research that shows that prayer brings that brain right into the middle. And I've seen it myself in some really cool um, ways, people that I've worked with when they're praying, what their brain does during neurofeedback sessions with the brain training headband, really, really neat, brings them right into a calm mode. And so for a program to stick, what we need to do is unwire the porn brain pattern, the one out in the extremes, rewire it so that you're in the middle and keep it there. So where spiritual programs tend to fall short is that they don't have strategies in place to keep your brain there. So when you pray, you can get there. Or when you're involved in the groups, or if you go there, you can get your brain there. But what it's not doing is hardwiring that pattern in. And it needs to be hardwired in to create a positive feedback loop that basically hardwires itself in and it doesn't unravel. That's what tends to be missing for many people when they engage in a just a spiritual program. So you should definitely add it, but think about neuroscience strategies or at least strategies that have a process to it. The program that I've put together, it has a process. It has a beginning, a middle, and not really an end, unfortunately, but a riding off into the sunset type of thing where you, you know you've unwired the pattern, you've set the defenses up, you've set up an offensive plan. You've created a life that feels really good to you. You've identified your stressors and your triggers. You've reduced them to as, as small as you can get them. You have healthy coping mechanisms in place for when they kick in. Because remember, Delta Foss B is that transcription factor that if you fire up that old neural pathway, it's still there. So you have to protect the lifestyle that you put together. And, you know, spirituality doesn't usually do that. Uh, here's a um, question from Phil. What is considered a relapse? Reset kills process a little. Please help. Okay, perfect. Hi, Phil. Uh, so I wanted to talk about this because I made the video. Relapse doesn't have to be inevitable. So I want you to know that because a lot of people's hijackers tell them on the way into this 30-day challenge, relapses are part of the deal. Relapses are not part of the deal. I work with Plenty of people who don't have a relapse. So know that. 
Now, if you have a relapse, do not beat yourself up because that is what is going to lead to a downward spiral of shame and guilt. So what do you count as a relapse? That's very individualized. And I'm going to give an example. I was a few people I've talked to this week. They're like, I relapsed. Okay. This is what you do when you relapse. You break it down. And I always write to people in the comments, dissect it, learn from it. What led you back? And it's always stressors. It's always a breakdown of the lifestyle that serves that person. Person. So usually it's a breakdown of workouts because many people get into working out and they love it. It's a breakdown of me time. It ends up being too much work, too much stress at work, not enough of that flexibly scheduled life. So figure out what that is. So is it a relapse? Relapse would cause you to relapse. So let me just define them first. A slip is it happened one time and you are, you learn from it and then you move forward and it doesn't happen again. A relapse is it happened on Tuesday and then you're like, uh, I slipped on Tuesday. So I might as well just, you know, watch and masturbate more. So a relapse tends to have more days to it or you can feel yourself sliding back into the pattern. And again, of course, it's, you know, if you have enough self-awareness to realize that, but you don't want a slip to become a relapse. That's why if you dust yourself off and go, the only reason that that happened was because on Friday nights, I always watch porn. I just started this 30 day challenge. It's Friday night. I didn't have anything else planned. I'm sitting around, it's raining out. And the, the urge and you're fighting the urge and you're being pulled into the screen by a super normal stimulus, you're being pushed into the screen by the stress of the week and you have no plan. So when you figure that out and you make the plan, what are you going to do next Friday night? You're going somewhere. Even if you just go to Starbucks and sit there and sip on a chai tea and you and a lot of times guys that I work with, what they'll do is they'll just break the physical and mental space. They don't even have to do it for hours. You just go to Starbucks, bring your Starbucks home, and you're already done with that urge. You can already move on to the next part of your night by breaking that physical and mental space. So here's what I want you to know. How do you know if it's a relapse? How do you know if it undid your process? If it's a slip, likely it didn't undo your process. Likely it is. it can help you move forward. If you take time and you look at it, it will move you forward it becomes the growth opportunity. You know, you can't exercise how to deal with a slip unless you've slipped. So not that I want you to slip, I want you to push through the slips and be able to analyze it in this way without slipping. But if you slip, I want you to go, what did, what happened? And then change it, make changes, the very specific changes to the thing that led you back. And so when you do that, then you're stronger than you were before you slipped. And so it actually can be you know, a way for you to crash through to the next side. But if you found that you did, you know, go back or you went back for a really long time, someone I talked to um, a few weeks ago said, you know, I just completely binged for hours. I ended up paying for stuff, downloading stuff, like, you know, it really just went full floor force into it. You know, then what's going on? And we know scientifically that there's an effect that when you stay away for a long time, if you go back down that slippery slope, you end up sometimes going all the way down. So in that case, if you spent hours that might, you know, it definitely damaged your brain. You'll feel it. People go, my brain felt like mush after that. And you'll feel guilt and shame. But if you learn from it, you can still use it to propel you forward. But it's individualized. So let me just tell you this one more thing. And then we can move on is that somebody else I talked to said I slipped. And, and actually, I didn't even ask because they weren't offering up what it was. I said, and this person's partner has been very supportive and talked about all everything that's going on with him the whole time. I said, is it something you need to tell your partner? And he said, I don't know. I'll let you know next time I talk to you. And so that is the way he can figure it out. Because if it hangs in his nervous system and he doesn't do the things to change it, then he needs to get it out so that it doesn't become something that brews but if he makes the changes and he learns from it and it didn't involve porn and it, it involved, you know, a little bit of masturbation and not orgasm, you know, this is someone who's doing great. So even the thought of something could be a slip or relapse. But if he takes care of what gave him the thought, then he can move forward. It's very individualized for for people. But basically, you know, you're doing something you shouldn't be. 
So you need to change it. It can be going on social media for some people. It can be going on YouTube for some people. It can be texting someone you're not supposed to in a way you're not supposed to. You know, it's very varied, but you know, you know. And if you know, don't ignore it. Know that you can use it to move forward. This kind of goes with that. Lucas says, um, I have a bad habit. It's always in the morning. I wake up, grab my laptop, you know, do my thing. Um, do you have any morning routines that you recommend that I can snap me out of this? Absolutely. So first of all, put your laptop somewhere else. We've talked about this. You need to put the laptop in a different location so that you, you need to pattern interrupt, interrupt the pattern you've been doing for a long time. So the laptop needs to be in a different place. Something that can really be very powerful for many people is to go for a walk or a run first thing, because that literally changes your physical and mental space. So some of the most successful people that I've worked with put sneakers right next to the bed, you know, get up, basically put your sneakers on right away and out the door. One gentleman I work with would do that with going to get coffee because he was a morning masturbator, you know, who's part of, you know, I've talked about this in the videos. I don't know if you've seen it. It's basically your brain going, I can't get through a day without a huge hit of dopamine. There's no way I can go get through this day. And you've trained your brain. The only way I get through my days of work and life and this and that is through a hit of dopamine early on. It's it's literally using it like a drug to get through the day. You don't want that. You don't want to have to drug your brain to get through your days. You want to get through. Your, you don't even want to get through your days. You want to rock out your days and enjoy them. So pattern interrupt physical and mental space. Go for a walk. Hopefully in the end, you can build a healthy morning routine. My morning routine is sacred space for me. It's amazing. It is, you know, especially if you have a lot of kids and a partner who likes to talk a lot. <laughs> if, if that's the case, when you get up and you're sitting there and it's silent, it is amazing. And I can think very intentionally about the day I want to create. It puts me in a good mood. Uh, yesterday, I, you know how I said, if some days I decide to sleep in because I'm tired yesterday, I slept in, which was great. It too felt great. But then I was cranky because I did not get normally I'm up for an hour and a half. I said to my husband, I'm like, I'm cranky. I don't get cranky. Thankfully, I could shake it off really quickly. But I'm cranky because I didn't get to ease in. I, I got out of bed and there's kids waiting for me. You know that I don't like, you know, so I like to get up and have an hour, hour and a half to myself where I'm the only one awake. It's a beautiful thing. Creating something like that is really powerful. And I know people put in the comments some of the morning routines that they've developed to be successful in this. So it's finding the right one for you. Maybe the, the walk's right for you. Maybe going to get some coffees right for you. Maybe going right into a meditation and reading and quiet time is good for you, but finding the one that works. Pattern interrupt mental and physical space though. Super Sunny D, you're totally right. The world is full of dopamine. Put the screen down and go find it, my friend. That's for sure. And David, thank you for your $100 donation. Oh, we are thanks. grateful. Um, I've got a question from BHO. I'm well over 500 days sober from PMO and sex addiction. I am going to purchase your 90 day program this month. Mm -hmm. How will it help me get my spark back in life? Yeah, totally. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to tell people this is that the way that I designed it was very intentional. It's all backed by science. But the thing that I wanted to share is that so many people say when they're going through the program that this isn't a program that's really designed to leave porn behind and masturbation Absolutely. behind. Of course, there's, big, there's a big portion of that, but it's actually, you know, the hero's journey. It's actually a program that's designed to help you tap into your full potential, figure it out, develop it and create it through action steps in your life. Because when you do that, when you set up the life that's perfect for you, when you figure out what that is and you establish it and you're willing to guard it at all costs, when you do that, there's just no need to go back into the screen. And we know from science, the reason people are going to porn is to regulate their mood. What that means is they're de-stressing or they're filling wounds and holes from trauma or they're bored. So those are the things that need to be solved. Solve the trauma, heal the wounds, fill the boredom with dopamine producing hobbies that you deserve to have hobbies. So many people don't think I deserve to be able to have downtime and have hobbies. 
you deserve to be able to go out and have fun. You deserve to be to have a job that fires you up so much you can't wait to get out of bed. People think they have to move through drudgery of, of work that puts food on the table. I'm here to tell you, you can monetize the things that you love and you can contribute. And so when you go through a program and you get fired up about that, and then you get fired up about developing healthy sexuality with a partner, most people want a partner, and if not healthy masturbation, like all the holes are filled and then there's no need for the screen. And so when you come to the other side of that and you're doing the things that you want to each day and you feel awesome and you know how to cope on the days that are stressful, you can just stay in that place forever. And, and you also, you know, get into a really good jam and you're rocking out your best life. This is uh, Dr. Trish, what do you say on this? For example, what if, what if the dad was too addicted to this porn? Then he, then cassettes were easily accessible in 70s, 80s, 90s. No money issues then. Can it be genetically passed to me um, or the child, me? I mean, the reason, the reason easy exposure during childhood, age 10, and then those materials were present in huge quantities. Uh, just found me and my dad enjoy some scenario categories excess. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I get the, the gist, Jamie, to just to move us forward is that we know that the it's multi-generational intergenerational. So that your brain has a propensity. There's a familial connection, but I don't use the word genetic. And I made a video on epigenetics. We're bigger than our genetics. Science proves that if we change the way that we think and act, we don't have to do the things that our parents did. And I told the story once about how I know for sure I've changed my genetics from my parents through my action steps. And I, I won't do it again today. But, you know, so, yeah, exposure at a young age is a risk factor and having a familial propensity for it is a risk factor but you're the captain of your own ship. So that's what I want you to know. And, and, you know, I made another video on, you know, your, your brain, the frontal lobe in your brain is the captain. And right now you're taking the captain out by going to porn. So when you fire your brain back up and you give the captain the power back, you have the ability to leave it behind and you don't have to, there is no foregone conclusion here because of what happened with your father. It definitely put you at risk and your brain was hijacked. And, and it's been a long time, then, you know, you have some work to do, but there's people I've worked with personally in their seventies who can have, have gotten rid of 60 year addictions. So it can be done. Absolutely can be done. All right. Affairs now in South Africa says, how do you know how, how do you know you have completely recovered. Do urges just go away or do they stay with you for a lifetime? Or do you uh, just have to fight them? Yeah. How do you fight them? Yep. I see it. Um, uh, fairs now in South Africa. This is what I'm here to tell you is that I, I just said it is that you might get urges and not for a lifetime. And even if you do, you're completely equipped to make them go away very quickly. The more you stick to the flexibly scheduled life that you love, the less you have urges and triggers. So you have to figure that stuff out for yourself. That's why I always say this is patternized, but individualized. And so when it's individualized, you go, okay, um, you know, I really can't go to the beach all the time because I'm way too triggered by all the women there. So if you're willing to make the lifestyle change of not going to the beach every weekend, you make it so that the urges go down 1 million percent. So like if you're if you can make those choices for yourself, then you set up a life that you love and you're really on purpose. But you're also staying out of those really stressful situations. And I know it's difficult to make those decisions, especially when you're in it for anybody. But so like an example of that is, um, you know, you are asked if you want a promotion to become the manager of 50 people. And, you know, you you're not sure if the stress of it will be good for you if you say no to that. And you, because you've got a lifestyle set up that feels good to you, then you can stay in a healthy place. If you take on all this additional stress, that might give you more urges. The urges are a call to regulate your brain, to give you dopamine, to offset cortisol. But if you're going into porn, porn's creating the cortisol in the world. So when you leave that away, 
when you leave porn behind, there's still cortisol at times, but it's less and you learn how to deal with it as long as you keep yourself out of high cortisol places. I don't know if that or, or situations. So the thing is, you don't have to fight urges for the whole rest of your life because you're too busy rocking out a life that you love. And what you end up doing is protecting that life by making really good decisions for you. And that's why I was joking when we when we came on is that I let my my balance in my life is a really precarious one. So when I when it get tips off just by a little, it affects me a lot. And I've been off for two months now. And Jamie and I made two, actually one slight schedule change of mine. And there's one more coming in next week. And I still have to make one more after that, honestly. But once I do that, I will be back to the balance that works for me. And so I felt awful. I was tired. You know, I told you all on the lives, I'm beat every Friday. That's what I said when I came on, because every Friday I'm like, oh, my God, it's Friday. Thank Friday. God. <laughs> Which I don't normally feel that way. This Friday, I'm like, Jave, I had the most amazing week. I feel really good. <laughs> and so, you know, that's the lifestyle. But it took me two months to make those. It should have taken me one minute to make that schedule change. Not two months, right? I know, but better, you knew so. what you needed to do. That's the thing. We'd get on the, you know, our call and you say, okay, I need to do this. I need to do this. And, and so it's, it's interesting, you know, that, that you knew exactly what, what needed to be done. It's just things kind of piled on and we had to. Yeah. And I kept piling them on. And I told Jamie, I'm like, you don't know this about me. And this is part of my program. The only reason I'm sharing this stuff about me is I think, you know, stories make for good ways of showing examples in the program, there's a lesson on your personality and your personality type. There's a lesson on your identity, you know, in learning about those things so you can keep the balance. And for me, I see opportunity absolutely everywhere. So when opportunity comes to me, which I'm looking for it, then I feel like I need to take every opportunity. So I took a couple opportunities that I just shouldn't have. So I said to Jamie, don't let me do that. And she's like, <laughs> look at me like, I, she's like, you thought it was a good opportunity. What are you talking about? I'm like, I am always going to think it's a good opportunity. You have to play devil's advocate. Do not agree with me. And I said, these are the things we're protecting. These are the things, this is important to us. We're, you know, we're here, but the other things they, if they don't fit into this box of our most important thing, then we have to say no to them. So we said no to some things and we buttoned up other things so that we can protect the things that are important and then I'll be back in a really good group. And that's what you need to do. That's what you protect. That's what you fight for in the end. And the people who establish that and then protect it, the urges are minimal in only in high stress situations. And then they already know what they're going to do to cope. That's right. Um, All right. Can you bring, can, can your brain really unwire, rewire and hardwire and be back to normal? hundred percent. I love when people ask me that because I'm like, why do you think I'm here all the time? Would I be selling? Uh, I love it when someone put on, you know, quackery, don't listen to, uh, there's one guy, Dowd is here in the, uh, without heckling me, but heckling me in the comments for, <laughs> and John, we, uh, John's on our team now. John's like, I, I'm going full blown Papa bear on him. He, he wanted to delete comments and I don't delete comments unless they're bad. I'm like, leave them there. It, the, he, you know, that's a call for help just saying that I'm a quack and what I'm talking about is not true. You can absolutely heal your brain. And I've seen people, lots of people make their brain better than it ever was. Because think about it. This thing started brewing when you were a kid or a young teenager for most people. So you can heal your brain from that. And then if you implement more of these strategies than you ever thought you would, if you have the courage to move towards finding the dream job that you've always wanted. Think what that does to your brain. Every single day you get up, it puts your brain in the brain boosting mode. Yes. It, for sure. It really does. If you've ever had a job you hated and on Sunday, you had the Sunday evening blues, knowing you had to go back for five days of an existence you don't like. Now on Sunday, if you're so psyched to go back to your work on Monday, for the most part, you know, it's a completely different brain mode. It's the brain mode that breeds health. When you're in stress and when you're depressed and when you're not on purpose, it's the brain mode that breeds disease. It really is. So when you get your brain into the flow, flow state, you're healing it by using it at all times. That's straight facts right there. That is so true. The job that I had prior to here, my boss was 
just I'll be nice. He was just mean. <laughs> um, and, you know, it was it was absolutely um, dreadful. I would wake up and and I hated getting up and going to work. And, and ever since I've started working here, obviously, I have the best boss in the world. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I absolutely love my job and I find myself working over and you know, I'll, I'll excellent. That benefits all of us now. <laughs> well, you know, but I, I really do. I'll find myself not even realizing it was funny. Me and John were in the office the other day and he said, it's 545, you know, right. and, and <laughs> yeah. he had no idea that the, the time just passes because you're enjoying what you're doing. So it, it truly is a gift to find oh, a job that you truly enjoy. So it really is. And even if you don't hate your job, I was reaching to get my book, which is the book that I am encouraging mm -hmm. people turning pro tap your inner power and create your life's work by Stephen Pressfield. He is Jamie's going to reach out to him, see if we can get him on the podcast. I don't know if we'll be able to, but he wrote the movie Bagger Vance, which I've talked about in some of the videos. Such a good movie. Watch that movie this weekend if you don't know what I'm talking about. But the reason I like it is because the pages are short. And if your brain's kind of hurting you from the 30 day challenge, each each page has a really cool big takeaway. And and Jamie, I ordered you a copy. I told you I was going to get you ones for you and John. Awesome. They're, they'll be here by month. They'll be here by Monday, just so you know I did that. Um, but if you get this book, it's about transitioning from even if it's not a job you hate, if it's just not the thing that you feel in your heart and your soul that you're here to do. When I was, I was a university professor. I've been one uh, for a long time. I don't even, we won't even go how long, you know, for before I transitioned out and to create my own business, I basically was teaching people. I taught online classes. The programs that I've been creating for almost 10 years in my own business I taught online as a university professor, very similarly in what he calls a shadow life in this book. And he, he talks about it from going from amateur in your own life to being the pro in your own life. And, you know, I was making good money. I literally only worked nine months a year, which is perfect for a mom with lots of kids. I didn't work all summer and I had off two months at, at the holidays. Like literally it couldn't be more perfect. I love the classes. I love the students. I love my, I loved everything. But then still inside of me, it was like, this isn't where you're supposed to be. And, and, you know, everybody thought I was absolutely nuts when I'm like, I had just been tenured. They could never fire me. I had been promoted. I got a big raise I never even saw. And I left because in my heart, I knew that that was a shadow existence. And I found this book. And this book was telling me everything I was feeling was okay. And that I was going to be fine if I left the comfort of the thing that felt good to me, but didn't feel true to me. I was going to be okay and that I was going to be better than okay. And it allowed me to make that transition by having the support of Stephen Pressfield's book. And he has a bunch of other ones, which are really great. So, you know, even if you don't hate your job, if you have something in there, I was telling someone else this week too, that, you know, if you don't want to leave your job to create that, you can create that love in your heart, in your avocation, in your side hustle, in your, in your hobbies, you know, there's a way to create the thing that you want in your life. And you have to have the courage and courage doesn't happen unless there's fear. And so when you feel the fear, that's the sign that it's okay to move towards it and not away from it. I'm glad you said it that way, because I think everybody is, is, uh, to some extent, um, scared of change. Um, totally. Change is hard and rightfully yeah. so, but you know, so I have I'm another, so um, question from Di, um, Dizam. Uh, my girlfriend just broke up with me because of my porn use, uh, it will be hard to get positive brain energy. Will it be hard to be, get positive brain energy during this times like this? No, and this is, I, I read that I was trying to find it again, but I read it. And what I want to tell you is that that is a bummer, but you can use that to motivate you. And, and, you know, I don't know if you have hopes of whenever I work with people and they say, you know, my wife just left me, my girlfriend just left me. First thing I ask is, do you have hopes of repairing it? And do you think it's reparable? You know, you can repair it. Sometimes the answer is yes. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes is, I don't know. So you have to enter a program for you, not for her. And so when you do that, you, you commit to yourself that you're going to do what's healthy for you and your partner can feel that. But no matter what, you're using this as the opportunity because you'll just go back into another relationship that's strained because of porn use if you don't dig into solving it. And so when you do solve it, then 
you can either repair your relationship and lots of relationships have been repaired that people didn't think they could repair them because when you become a healthier version of yourself, it's palpable. People feel it on you. A lot of people don't even know what's going on or why they know you're different. They know that that different is something they like better. So you might be able to repair your, your partnership, or you can move on to a healthy one. That's really the goal. Uh, let's see. We got some theorizing. Yeah. Somebody wrote in the comments that we should theorize about why the porn industry exists. I said, I can't do that on this channel, but that would be fun. <laughs> uh, do you How have can one more I thought or question for us? And then we'll wrap up. Because I um, am a quack. Oh, John, don't call me a quack. You're too funny. Quackery. I'm not a quack. This stuff's real. Spitting straight facts. Oh, I just lost it. And, and I'll just go back and make one more comment about partners too, is that communicating openly with your partner can go a long way. I know people don't want to hear it, but even if it's not about porn use, just getting better at communicating about your feelings. And I saw it on Instagram last night. Dr. Daniel Amen is one of my mentors who I've trained through. He had a post from the Amen Clinic. He had a post yesterday that said things you can control, things you can't control. And, you know, you can control your own feelings. You can control how you respond or not react the way you respond within an interaction. And you can control the way that you interact with people and you communicate your feelings. So if you let in your partner and it doesn't have to be about porn use specifically, but when you get vulnerable and you let your partner in, you create more intimacy. And likely what your partner is upset about is that you've hid it or that you've lied to her. It's a total lack of intimacy. It's a break, a rupture in the attachment that you had. It's called an attachment fault line. Like literally you were attached as a partnership and then now it's cracked in, in half, like, you know, a fault line. So you have to repair that it's rupture and repair. So when you say, I'm sorry, I'm going to get into a program and I'm going to work on being able to not use porn anymore. And I'm going to be open and honest with you. You start to repair that rupture and you can have a better relationship than you've ever had because of that. So this question is from Sal Ritelli. Uh, What about positive affirmations? Do you think they help? Absolutely. Definitely, because our speaking of Dr. Daniel Amen, he has something and I've included it in, the, in my 90 day program, um, something that he calls ants, automatic negative thoughts. And the ants come marching in brains default to negative thoughts because of our programming. Most of us grew up in programming that is very negative. It's the very rare person who, uh, you know, even even I'm growing up these kids and they still default to negative where I have to framework shift them to see the positive. So when you say positive affirmations, you are moving that energy in your brain from these extremes into the middle, basically every time. And so they empower you by bringing your brain to where we want it to get and stay. So the more you say those affirmations and then hopefully what happens for you across, you know, this challenge or your program or your life as you continue to work on yourself is that you have an ultimate framework shift, which is positive psychology, which comes out of the University of Pennsylvania. Martin Seligman is the father of positive psychology and it's pragmatic optimism. It's not all roses and sunshine, toxic optimism. It's I'm going to do the things I need to do in my life and it's going to work out great. I'm going to leave this university job and I'm going to create my business and I'm going to work hard at it. It's going to rock and it's going to help the world and it's going to feed my fam squad. That's pragmatic optimism, getting my butt in the chair and doing the work every day, caring about it so much. And then, you know, being willing to throw myself out there. But there's tons of positive affirmations. And on the days that are tricky for me, when bad stuff happens to me or seemingly bad stuff, because I try to teach my stuff myself, there's no such thing as bad stuff. There's just stuff that I have to deal with. When that stuff comes to me, I double down on the positivity. Jamie knows this in the short amount of time we've been working together. When something comes at me, I double down on how can I use this for my good? I look for it. I Bad stuff's happened lately, you know, and I'm like, 
how can I make this good? And then I find the good and then I work from the mode of making that seemingly bad thing good. That's all positive affirmations. I tell myself, I got this. I can do this. And this is a growth opportunity. And when I deal with this thing and I handle it with grace and you can make them short and snappy, uh, I'm strong and getting stronger. That is when I was younger, my finger was hurt, which a different story for a different time. And my husband and I would always say it's well and getting weller. Well, he was hurt. <laughs> he, my finger, he, my finger was hurt for years. And literally we named him Weller. And I referred to him as Weller the other day. And my little daughter's like, Weller, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh my gosh, you probably don't even know the story that Dan and I called this finger Weller for like 10 years. But every single day I'm like, I wouldn't go, oh, my finger is so messed up. I wouldn't say that. I would say, you know, come on, Weller, you got this. <laughs> and no joke, Weller's fine now. And that was a, you know, so like, you know, but I didn't sit around like just affirming that Weller is going to get better. I did all the things I needed to do to help Weller get better, but it took a long time. But I also was telling Weller that he could get better. And also they have many books out there, but this book that Dr. Lee actually uh, had given me um, from her collection, she said pick from. So it it's self-meditation, um, 3,200 mantras, tips, quotes, and quotes cones for peace and serenity so it's it's a really uh useful book and I'm, I'm using a lot of these in the daily emails that i'm sending out for the 30-day challenge which if anybody is interested in getting motivated and wanting you know a little extra support um please go and sign up um at uh dr trish lee's website you will um go to download the blueprint. And when you enter your email address, that will give me um, your email address. So I will be able to send out daily emails to keep you motivated and, and just give you a little extra support on this, this journey. Yeah. And it is amazing how just one little ditty, you know, that's why I always call positive juju. Like you just put one little ditty in your mind in the morning. That's what I do in my morning practice is I read for just a couple of minutes. I meditate, but I put one little good thing in there each day. Normally when Jamie and I get on our meetings, I'm like, guess what I read today? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I read today that as long as I stay on purpose, everything's going to be fine. <laughs> not fine. Everything's going to be great. <laughs> she, she, she stared at me like I'm a nut job. I'm not a quack, but I might be a nut job in some regards <laughs> in this positivity. But, you know, I'm like, it, and that's me affirming, like, let's, let's go at that. And it actually had to be with focus. It was when we said no to some things. And saying no to opportunities hard for me. So then the next day I read, it's okay to say no, because when you say yes to the one thing that matters, you will move forward with everything you need. And I'm like, awesome. Totally awesome. Cause I needed to hear that. Um, okay. You got one more question. Are we ready to wrap up? I've got one more. Um, do you talk about edging and no, in no flap or in sex? Well, they're similar, but different. So like, and actually Dr. Rena Malik and I talked about this a little bit, is that a healthy sexual experience is supposed to have, these were her numbers, but I've talked about this before in the difference between porn sex and real sex video, is that it's supposed to have more arousal and then less of the actual, you know, culmination towards orgasm. So arousal is, is foreplay, but letting arousal builds slowly over time. And we were saying, she was saying in the 20 minute, 15 to 20 minute range, then actual heightened arousal is five minutes or less. So when you're edging, what you're doing is you're keeping your brain in this hyper arousal state for a long time. So you're flooding your brain with dopamine. And Dr. Malik and I were talking about prostates primarily. I, I kept bringing brains into it, as you can imagine, but you're also stressing your prostate out because the prostate is designed to, you know, basically build up seminal fluid and then dispose or get rid of it, not to let it linger in there for a long time. That taxes your prostate, which is why the study shows that it can lead to more prostate cancer if you're taxing your prostate all the time. Edging is one way you're going to tax your brain and your prostate because you're keeping them in this hyper aroused state for too long, for an unhealthy amount of time. So if you do that in sex, it's not the same as when you're inclu including a super normal stimulus of pornography consumption, but you're still dangling your brain in this mode it's only supposed to be in for a little while. You're keeping it there for a long while. And it's because you're addicted to the rush and the feeling of it. 
for this massive amount of mood regulation from hyper to hypo arousal. So knowing why you're doing it is really important. Like, why are you edging during sex? It's because you don't, having just the typical, which typical is fantastic. Typical is not boring. I just want to say that because we've gotten emails where, you know, people think just regular sex is boring sex. It's not what I'm talking about. Regular sex is fantastic sex at the right levels. And when your brain recalibrates, you'll know that. But if you're going for these heightened arousal states for a long time, you're frying out your brain, you're frying out that reward center and you're, you know, deactivating the frontal lobe, which will keep you going back there. So edging is not good in a sexual experience. Building arousal slowly over time is good, not lingering in that heightened arousal state. And it's much worse for you when pornography is included. Now add one more quick one. Mr. Wonderful says, how do we reverse our brain neuro pathway? Mm -hmm. The way you do it is you first and foremost, you stop watching porn. That's what unwires the neural pathway you've been using. The reason you're so uncomfortable if you have withdrawal symptoms is because your brain is going, whoa, this is what we do. We, we watch porn so that we can feel good. And so if you feel squirrely, it's because your brain is unwiring that pattern. But more importantly, you have to rewire because what science shows is you'll never fully be able to unwire that pattern. You will, in fact, be able to stop using it completely, though. But the way you stop using it is by using new neural pathways. And that's why the defensive plan is just blockers, just fences to keep you out of the screen. Most importantly, is to rewire your brain for new neural pathways through all the action steps that I tell you. So when I say get on purpose, I mean get on purpose. Look at your life and change. The more things you change in your life that make you feel good and give you dopamine in your life, the better. That's why I joked in the first video this week that you know, your family might start thinking you're crazy because you're, you know, instead of being in your room all the time, now you're outside playing basketball. They'll be like, what's Jimmy doing outside playing basketball all the time? Or why is he going fishing? But when you get engaged in your life in that way, that's how you rewire your brain using new neural pathways and the neural pathways that is, are the easiest for us to start firing up is in work because we spend a lot of time there. So we might as well like our conversation already on work. Use our neural pathways in a really healthy way, not a stressed way, a calm way, calm focus. Use it in our relationships. You got to dig into your dynamics in your relationship and repair them. Be willing to have the difficult conversations. Be willing to be vulnerable and share yourself with people. And then go do as many hobbies as possible. Balance your day out. Don't be bored. Don't be sitting around. Make a plan, which I have to wrap up because I have an appointment. But before I do, make a plan for this weekend, especially I encourage you in this 30-day program that we're doing, if you usually watch porn anytime during this weekend, I want you right now in your journal to think about when do I usually watch it and fill it with something else. Do not sit around allowing yourself to feel urges in the same mental and physical place. Go do something else. Plan it right now. And like I said, you don't have to plan it for hours. You have to plan something to pattern interrupt. It will work. It will help you. So figure out what you're going to do this weekend and fill those holes. Um, what do I have going on this weekend? I said no to everything this weekend. Do you like that? I did. Talk I am about proud getting... of you. Thank you. I was proud of myself too. And I, you know, I went out every night this week, basically with my kids doing a lot of good momming and my husband, you know, I'm a, I'm a type five, which is Enneagram, which is what I talk about in personality types. And it's so funny because we were driving last night and I said this week, Friday night, I'm going to do all the things that are important to me. <laughs> and I go, I'm going to work out and then I'm going to chill and then I'm going to bed early. And he goes, he goes, those are the things that are important to you. I'm like, for right now, yes. Yes. I feel like I haven't chilled at all. My friends are doing something tonight. Normally we hang out on Friday nights. I told Jamie, the last two Friday nights, we did not get home till after one o'clock. <laughs> and then I take my daughter to the horse barn on Saturdays. We're there till like two o'clock. I have been dragging, dying, you know. And then last weekend was Halloween. We had a Halloween party and then we did trick or treating. This weekend, I'm like, no, ladies, we cannot go on Friday night. We have nothing planned Saturday and Sunday. And uh, my husband usually golfs on Fridays and Sundays. He's not. So it's going to be very chill. What about you, Jamie? Got anything exciting going on? 
going to see uh, grandparents, you know, just uh, helping her around the house. And uh, we used to, you know, go swimming every weekend, but obviously that's not something we can do right now. Uh, we know, are actually closing the pool up. It's time to close the pool. So chilly in North Carolina. I love it. I'm going to get outside a little and enjoy being outside because I haven't. Uh, it's beautiful. It is it gorgeous? Yeah, mm -hmm. Super fun. Okay. Well, everybody have an awesome weekend. Plan what you're going to do next week. Um, I've already made a couple of the videos, just two of the videos. There's videos this weekend too, because we are going um, 30 days. So there's a video coming tomorrow, video coming Sunday. I already did the ones for tomorrow uh, until Tuesday. We're going to talk about the offensive plan. We're going to talk about intimacy um, then we're going to get into purpose more. I've already made those. So please tune into them coming up in the next couple of days. Then we're going to start breaking down the strategies to heal your brain and to start using those new neural pathways. So uh, be sure to stay engaged so you can evolve, like we always say, because it will work. It will work. So stay with and us. If you want to be on the email list, you can email info at drtrishlee.com. Um, we will add you to the email list or you can download the blueprint on the website at um, www.drtrishley.com. Yeah, awesome. Have a wonderful weekend. Okay. Bye everybody. Have a good one. Bye. Bye Jane. Thank you. Thank you.